All right, well, good morning. It's 11 o'clock. We're going to get started. We're glad you're here. We're going to welcome everybody via Facebook Live as well. So I'm going to ask Don Guzman since he'd like to talk this morning. If he would, just stand up and lead us in a word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful weather and this beautiful morning that you've given to us today. Lord, we just ask that you, uh, our thoughts today would just only be focused upon you. Lord, for you, and you are the author, the perfecter, and finisher of our faith. Father God, may we put all else out of our mind, the troubles of the world, and any concerns we might have. Lord, that we might focus today on what you would have to share with us through music, through the message, through our time of worship. We give you all the honor, the glory, and praise. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Mm -hmm. Please stand up and do our first song, Victory in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hines, he's kind of uh, taking his head of that up and doing a wonderful job with it. 
Um, I've had some people ask about what's our plans as far as the services go. We're going to maintain doing what we're doing right now. Um, one service a week, Sunday morning only, uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, just because of the virus and everything going on. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Um, leftovers from the produce giveaway, there's still grapes in the fridge back there, so if you would like grapes, please take some with you. Um, I'm assuming they're still good. Uh, Tim, you sampled some this morning. Are they good still? They're still uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I see him sampling, so I figure I'd ask him. He's, he's still alive and well back there. So. Yeah, you'll keep a watch on it. But uh, that's really the only announcements. We won't be passing the offering plate. It'll come up front. And uh, I guess we'll do our next song. Please. No, no, no. I hit the... I was getting ready for it, and I He's forgot I started playing. Morning, he must have looked at uh, all the slides from my message. There were like 56 slides. So. Not really. I'm just, we're, we're going straight down to the invitation. Uh, as far as offering goes, yeah. we won't be passing the plate. If you have anything, you can just play at the offering plate. So. But this time, we're going to do a song that we've done a couple times. Uh, it's via video. Uh, it's called One Day. But it really talks about where we're at in our society and how we're so divided. But one day, we'll all be hand in hand as we are. So if you would please stand as we sing, one day. One day there'll be no more waiting left for our souls. One day there'll be no more children longing for
we are divided by so many things, whether it be a political view, whether it be the color of our skin, or even whether or not you go to church, or the way you feel about this virus. We're all consumed, and we're torn apart by the things of this world. But one day, that won't be anymore. One day, we will walk step by step with our Savior.
the things that we say and the songs that we sing is a sweet, sweet sound. God help us this morning as we're looking at the word and looking at the idea that you are our living hope. And God, I just pray that you'll guide and direct and the things that are said, that it will be honoring and pleasing to you. Take the words that I say and the words that come from your, your word and may they find lodging in our heart so that we can be a different person. That we can be the Christian that you designed for us to be. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Over the last several weeks, we've been looking at 1 Peter. That's where we're going to be again this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, you want to follow along. But we've been looking at the idea of living hope. And that's found in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 3 is where that's found at. But we're going to be looking in chapter 2 to start with. And the first week, we looked at the idea of our living hope rests in the essence of our salvation. And we also looked at the idea that our living hope results in eternal solutions to our temporary problems. When you look at our world and look at the things that we're going through, there's lots and lots of problems going on. You think about it. Look at all the problems that we're facing. You know, one of the things that Tim talked about last week was with this whole pandemic, we see marriages strengthened. But we've all seen, also seen marriages destroyed. Because Satan worms his way in. Even in the middle of a pandemic, he worms his way in. He takes the weak parts and he starts attacking. So we have a lot of temporary problems. And then we also found that our living hope is rooted in a personal relationship to our Savior. Outside of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we have no hope. You know, we try to find hope in lots of places. We try to find hope in possessions. There's people who are out there looking at trying to find hope in the things that they can buy, whether it be houses or cars or whatever. There's people out there trying to find hope in those relationships. Boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. And they think that's going to provide them hope, but it won't. There's people out there that try to find hope in alcohol and drugs, but there is no hope in those things. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at the idea of living this hope in a hopeless world. We've talked about the hope. We've looked at the idea that we have hope. But how do we live with this hope in this world? You know, I don't know about you, but a lot of times if I turn on the news, it makes me feel kind of hopeless. You look at all the fighting and the warring and the bickering and arguing and people just being negative. It can be hopeless. So how do we live with this hope in a hopeless world? We're going to read quite a bit this morning. I promise I'm, not, I'm really not going to be that long. But there's a lot of scripture we're going to look at this morning. Starting in verse 11, it says, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Chapter 2, verse 11 is where we're at. I beg you. What's Peter saying? He says, I'm pleading with you, watch yourself. Abstain from the fleshly lust." Excuse me. Too many times we like to give in to the fleshly lust, don't we? Why? Because it's temporary pleasure. We're going to be talking a little bit more about that close to the end of the service. But that's what's wrong with our world, a lot of us. Think about it. Why do we have a drug problem? Why do we have alcoholism? Why do we have marriage being broken up? Because of an affair? Right there's the reason. Because we give in to fleshly lust. We're all about the immediate recognition. You know what? I want to feel good now. But there's cost associated with those lusts. Verse 12. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may. By your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as the supreme, or to the governors <coughs> as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Verse 15, for this is the will of God, 
that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of the foolish men. How do we quiet down the world? This verse tells us. For this is the will of God. By doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of the foolish men. When they start talking about, you know what, there is nobody that cares about anybody. There's nobody that loves anybody. How do we show them otherwise? By doing what God's called us to do. He's called us to love. He's called us to be his hands and his feet. Then we can put that ignorance, which is not a negative term. Ignorance just means the, basically the idea of not knowing. There's a lot of us who are ignorant when it comes to the word of God. Because we just don't know what God's word says about things. Even things that are going on in our own life, we don't understand it. So we're ignorant. The issue comes is when we live in ignorance. When we don't try to find it. When we don't try to figure out what God wants in our life. Verse 16. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak or vice, but as a bondservant of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Verse 18, servants, be submissive to your master with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Tim, move me back one verse. Let's skip to 20 and go back to 19, please. One more. Okay, then go on. I need to be on verse 19. Or this is commendable if because of conscience for, conscience for God one endures grief suffering wrongfully for what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently but when you do good and suffer if you are to take it patiently that <clears throat> this is commendable before God for this you are called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. What's Peter saying here? What were you called for? As Christians, we were called to suffer. He said back and said, well, that isn't a very good life. That don't sound happy. Why do we suffer? We suffer because he suffered. Think back for a moment. How much did Christ suffer? Christ suffered way more than we'll ever suffer for our faith. He was beaten. He was crucified. The last time I checked, none of us are going to be crucified for our faith, physically. That doesn't mean we won't be crucified emotionally. Even friends may crucify us for our faith. We may lose friends. We may lose relationships because of our faith in Christ. That's suffering. Verse 22. Who committed no sin, nor was deceived was deceit found in his mouth. Tim, go back one more slide. Keep jumping on me. Okay. Yes. Who, when he was re reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. For we were like sheep, not astray. But we have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of our soul, your souls. Wives. This is, this is the part that can be hard. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. That even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your, ch your, chaste con your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, and putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be hidden, be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy woman 
who were women who were trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Husbands, likewise, well with them, with the understanding, giving honor to the wife, as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together for the grace of life, that your prayers may be may not be hindered. You know, a lot of times men look at this verse and say, see, women are weak. That's not what this is saying at all. It's talking about the order that God put in effect. That the husband was to be the head of the household. But here's the thing. Women are not weak. They are our equal. God gave me Eric as a help me. That doesn't mean that I rule over her. But that all that means is that I am ultimately going to answer to God for what happens in our household. That means if my children are not, are not raised right, guess who answers for it? It's not going to be her. It's going to be me. When you look at the church, God did the same thing with the church. Guys, we are responsible for the church. That doesn't mean ladies are important. Could we run a church without our, the ladies? We could could I run my household without my wife? I could. Somebody's got to clean. I am not going to clean. Okay? She's good at that. I would say cook, but I don't want to lie to church. Okay? We don't do that. But she also helps with the kids. There's times that I'm not as compassionate when the kids get hurt. My idea of being compassionate is, oh, you'll be okay. Just get up and quit wine. That's my idea of compassion. Most guys are kind of like that. That's just how we are. But she's a little more caring and soothing. She worries when they're crying because something happened and they're upset. I'm like, it's life. Deal with it. That's just how I am. It's easier for me to be compassionate to other people than it is even to my own family. But verse 8, finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be Courteous. Wow. Isn't that a stark difference between what we see in our world today and what God's telling us to do? How, how much love is being shown? How much like-mindedness is being shown? Even in churches, sometimes you don't have that. Not returning evil for evil, or revealing or reveling for reveling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You look at all that scripture, you say, we're going to be here forever. And I promise we won't. Five groups identified by Peter. There's five groups that we see that we have to do this thing called living in hope with. What are these groups? Number one, it's the unbelievers. As Christians and as we're living through this life, people are watching us. We're going to be in the middle of unbelievers. Think about it. When I go to work or I go to Walmart, what am I surrounded by? I'm surrounded by unbelievers. I'm surrounded by those who do not know who Christ is. Is that a good thing? It is a very good thing. And it's a very bad thing. You sit back and say, how can it be both? It's a great thing because if I'm not surrounded, if I'm not in the world, how am I ever going to share Christ with anybody? If I'm just surrounded by my Christian friends and people who go to church, I have no opportunity to share the love of Christ and share the hope that I have. But it can also be a bad thing. Because if I'm only surrounding myself with these people, then I'm going to be drawn away from Christ. So there has to be a balance. We have to be in the world, but not of the world. So we're surrounded by unbelievers. The second group we're going to, we see is human authorities such as government. In today's society, there is such an uprising over government. It doesn't matter whether we're Republican or Democrat. Because 
we are told that we are to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. What does that mean? That I need to be obedient to what the government says. When you walked in this morning, we asked that you have masks on. Is that because I didn't want to see your face? Some of you, yes. Don, yes, I did. But you know what? What it is, is our governor said that if you're going to be up and about, if you're going to be in a, in a setting like this, then he asked for us to wear masks. We're, we're doing what he's asked. We took your temperature. We're doing all the precautions of what the governor has asked. Does that mean that we like them? No. There's things that I hate about this. I hate to put a mask on. I do. Especially at school. I, I'm horrible about remembering to grab my mask. And then I do have it on, I feel like I'm choking. I feel like I'm, it's just not comfortable. But, out of respect for our government and the authority they have, we need to listen. You know, a lot of people talk about, well, what if this person gets president? Or what? You know, we can sit here and we can speculate. And we, we don't have to like both candidates. It doesn't matter who's in office. We need to respect the office in which they hold. And if God has allowed them to take that office, then it's part of his plan. You know, that's the thing we don't understand sometimes, that we don't see the huge plan that God has laid out. In all reality, it doesn't matter who takes the White House in November, who wins the election, because our country is going to go down the path that God has set for. He knows what's going to happen. He knows he's going to win the election. And we need to just respect that office. Number three. Is the everyday relationships such as work? How many of you have been in a work situation where it is always easy to like your co-workers? We've all been in there. There's times that our co-workers are annoying. There's times that our co-workers are rude, they're crude, and they just want to attack us. You know what? We need to watch those relationships as well. Because we are placed in our place of employment for a reason. We're placed around that group of people so that we can be the light. But if we are not being the light, then what are we being? We're being the darkness. We're drawing them away. We're hindering them seeing this hope. The fourth group is marriage. Look at our country. Is marriage important in our country anymore? I hate to say that it's not. You said back to what do you mean by that? Divorces are easy now in our country. Does that mean there's never a case for divorce? No, there is. You know what? Sometimes it's the first out. I can get married tomorrow, and if I don't like it, I can get divorced the next day. It's okay. Is that God's plan for marriage? God's plan for marriage is that we work it out. Does he understand when things don't work? He does. But it shouldn't be the first easy out. Just like any other relationship, marriage is hard. It takes work. It takes time. And it takes commitment. There isn't a ruler. It's a coexistence. I said earlier that, wait a minute, husband, husband's in heaven house. That doesn't mean he's a ruler. That doesn't mean that he talks down to his wife. That doesn't mean that he treats her like she is a subordinate or that she doesn't count because that is not the case. We are all even when it comes to our importance. God created male and female as equals. He gives us more responsibility, gentlemen, but he loves his daughters just the same as he loves us. The fifth grade is everyone. He said that's a broad category. And it is. And you understand that a little bit. Application. At the heart of this application is the evangelism of those who are without hope. You look at all those groups, and it's all about reaching the world for Christ. We have hope. We've talked about that. We have a living hope. The question is, what are we doing with that living hope? You know, I could say, you know what? This bottle of water, 
inside of this is the cure for cancer. The cure for autism. The cure for you name the disease. And you know what? I can share this with every one of you. But I can also do this. I'm going to hide this. And I'm going to leave it set right here so that no one else knows what I have. And it's just for me. What's the right response for us to do? The right response is for me to get this out and give it to everyone I can give it to. You say, well, eventually you'll run out. Yeah, but that's a small container. But when we're talking about the hope of God and the hope for eternity, when does it run out? It never runs out. According to Scripture, Christ welcomes everybody to repentance. He wants everybody to have the same hope that we have. But the issue is we're greedy with it. We don't give it out. We're scared. We just want to hold on to it for ourselves. Shame on us as Christians. We need to start giving that hope to others. We need to start sharing that hope and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with everybody we come in contact with. You sit back and say, Pastor, you don't understand. I just can't talk to people about that. You don't have to say a word sometimes. You just have to be willing to make an impact in their lives. Invest in people. Why do we do what we do? Because I feel it's important that we invest in people. A heart, at the heart of this application, is the evangelism of those who are without hope. How many people do we know today that are without hope? Just look around you. There are tons of people in our community, right here in Beaver, that don't have hope. They may not even realize they don't have hope because they don't understand their need for the Savior. It is our job as a church. It is our job as individuals. It is my job as a pastor to equip you that you go out here and you share that hope with the people. Our example is Jesus Christ. Think about it for a moment. What did he give up for you? He gave up everything. He gave up heaven for you. The great thing is, he would do it again in a heartbeat. Why? Because he loves you that much. And we are to use him as our example. That means we should love each other as much as he loved us. How different would our world look if we loved each other that way? Did he come to be served? No. He came to serve. We think we're here so people can serve us. You know what? That church over there, it's up to them to make me feel good when I come to church. That isn't our goal to make you feel good. Our goal as a church is to make sure you understand God's word and what he wants for your life. Is there going to be times it's going to feel good? There are times it's going to feel good, but there's also times it's going to hurt. Because God's going to show you something that you need to change in your life, that you're not doing the right way. And he's refining you, making you who he wants you to be. Our example. So what? We need to count the hidden costs of your actions and my actions. What do I mean by hidden costs? How many of you, you see this ad, cell phone bill, you can have a cell phone service with this and this and this for $49.99. Then you get your first month bill, and it's $113.99. Well, there's all these costs involved. What do I mean by cost? There's the tax, there's connection fee, there's this fee and that fee. Wait a minute, you said it was this. Well, these were hidden costs. And we, went, we just came back from Tennessee, and if you look on the internet, this, this cabin is thousand dollars for a week sounds like a great deal seven days oh, that's a great deal but the next thing you know there's a cleaning fee there's a firewood fee there's a everything fee that adds up quickly pastor what does that have to do with what you're talking about we talked about hope and finding hope sometimes we look for hope in the wrong places too many times we look for hope in a relationship when the relationship isn't really meant to be. 
say, well, what kind of what kind of hidden cost is there with that? How about the hidden cost of emotional abuse? How about the hidden cost of physical abuse? You say, well, okay, I'm not even that. How many times do we look for hope in a bottle? You look at our, our community, even here. Alcoholism is huge. And we step back and say, you know what? It's not a big deal. I'm not hurting anyone. There's hidden costs associated with that. All it takes is one too many drinks getting behind the wheel, and there's cost. And the thing is, even once you break that, there's costs that keep happening. Because people associate you with what you used to do. Drugs. Is there any hidden cost to drugs? Oh, you know what? I'm a teenager. It ain't no big deal. I can just try it just this once. Yeah, you might be right. It may only be once. But the thing is, what's in your head? You know what? I don't remember how that made you feel. I'm not feeling good today. I'm down. I'm out. I'm going to go back to that. There's always hidden cost to everything. The question is, what do we do with it? There's only one thing that I know that there's no hidden cost with, and that's the relationship with Jesus Christ. He is very upfront and knowledgeable and tells us that, you know what, when you accept me as your Lord and personal Savior, there's going to be some great times. There's going to be times that you're going to love it, but there's also going to be times that you're going to be faced with trials. There's going to be times that it's going to be hard. But the great thing is, when, I, when you're going through those tough times, when you're going through those hard times, you're not alone. Because I'm going to be there with you. I love the passage that says that no temptation has taken man. No temptation has... Yes. <laughs> it just lost my mind that quick. Uh, no temptation has taken you, but such is common to man. But with every temptation, he will make a way of escape. And you think about it, you say, what do you mean a way of escape? How do I get out of the temptation? How do I get out of this? Think back to Joseph for a minute. Potiphar's wife looked at Joseph. He was a nice-looking young man. And she had the desire to sleep with him. And he knew what she was doing. And he's like, no, no. But she wouldn't take no for an answer. So she grabs him and tries to seduce him. And what's he do? He runs out of his place to get away from her. Christian, when's the last time we ran from sin like that? A lot of times we don't. We say, you know what? It's okay. It's not going to hurt anything. Nobody's going to care. I beg to differ. God does care when we sin. God does worry about it. And it's important to Him. So what, what's the hidden cost? The hidden cost is one day we're going to answer for everything we've done. We're going to answer for how we treat our mate. We're going to answer for the lies we've told. We're going to answer for the people that we didn't share Christ with. The sad reality is, one day, it'll be okay. But we will answer for everything that we've done. Matthew 16, 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, a lot of people are giving in exchange for their soul that temporary pleasure of that relationship they shouldn't be in. That temporary pleasure of that drink, or that temporary pleasure of that drug, or that temporary pleasure of getting that possession that you just have to have. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? You know, I don't care what we own. I don't care what money you have in your bank account. I don't care what kind of relationship you have. If you have not surrendered, surrendered your heart to Christ, you're going to lose everything. Because when I pass from this life to the next, I can't take my bank account with me. I can't take that relationship with me. I can't take that house with me. It's left. There's only one thing that I can take with me when I pass it this life and the next, and that's my soul. Our soul is going to reside in one of two places, either heaven or hell. A lot of churches don't want to hear about this thing called hell, because it isn't a pleasurable, pleasurable thing 
to hear about. But hell is as real as you and I are sitting here today. What is hell? Hell is a place designed for Satan and his angels. The sad reality is there's tons of humans there too. Why? Because God isn't love? No. Because we choose not to accept the gift of salvation and through Jesus Christ. How do we get to heaven? Super easy. All we have to do to get from here, after this life, to heaven rather than hell, is accept the gift of Jesus Christ and what he done with Calvary. What he did? He laid down his life for you and me. You want to talk about living this hope in a crazy world? What kind of world was it when Christ was here? You sit back and say, when it wasn't as bad as what it is today, you're right. But there were still issues. Here he is, the perfect son of God, being crucified in between two thieves. Was that by accident? Nothing was by accident. He was placed there to show his love for mankind. You say, how do you know that he loved men? What did he say to the one thief? Today, you will be with me in paradise. As he's hanging there, suspended between heaven and earth, laying down his life, he was worried about someone else before he was himself. The other great thing, if I was the only one here on earth, he would have done the same thing done on Calvary. Because he loves me and he loves you that much. A lot of times we sit back and say, you know what, we don't have to worry about this thing called salvation. I'm, I've got a lot of years ahead of me. You know, I'm 43. I'm coming down to that halfway point, we'll call it, hopefully. But you know what? As kids, as teenagers, we think we have our whole life ahead of us before we have to really take this thing called Christianity serious. We're not guaranteed the next breath. You know, what happens if before we finish this message, Christ comes back? It's a very real possibility. When you look at Scripture, it says not even the Son of Man knows when he's going to return. The only person that knows when Christ is coming back is God the Father. And he could say, you know what? I'm done. Look at this year. Look at what's going on in our, our world. I'm... I'm a firm believer that it couldn't be long before Christ returns. And I want to make sure that I know that I know that I'm ready. But as a Christian, I need to make sure that I'm sharing that hope. And I'm telling everybody I can about Christ. Because I don't want my friends and my loved ones to be left. Because if they're left, they get to go through what's called the seven-year tribulation. And the other thing is, there is no hope for them. Because it's, it's, in Scripture it says that we are, once we've heard, there doesn't have to be a second chance. God gives us a chance. He wants everybody to hear. He wants everybody to say, but how long is he going to allow us to keep rejecting that gift? Before he says, you know what, no more. The choice is ours. What's your relationship like? Are you a believer? Are you not a believer? Maybe you are a believer, but you're not living in this world and showing the hope that you should. This morning, let's get our priorities right. I believe as Christians, our number one priority should be sharing the love of Christ with everyone we come in contact with. And I also believe that we should be living the life that God's called us to live. What does that life look like? It looks like this book. I can't give you everything that's in this book in 20 minutes on Sunday morning. It's important for you to dig in this book. It's important for you to get in this book and read. Is it hard to understand? There's things in there that are very hard to understand. There's things in there that I have no clue what they mean. It's not my job to know what it means. It's my job to read it. It's the Holy Spirit's job to show me what I need to know out of this book. But when I'm looking at my life, and I'm looking at what's going on, and what God wants from me, He's going to point me in the direction. He's going to show me what he wants me to be and how he wants me to be. If you've never accepted Christ, I challenge you this morning, don't wait. Come, let us take a look at the Bible and show you how you can accept Christ as your personal Savior. You say, well, you know what, I'm not going to do that. That's not important. 
the acceptance of Christ is the most important decision anyone will ever make. It's more important than the spouse. It's more important than your job. It's more important than where you live because it changes your destiny from hell to heaven. And the great thing is, unlike me buying a house or me buying a car or me getting married, this decision costs me nothing. It's free. But it cost Christ his life. And he laid it down for you and for me. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you this morning. God, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you that you are our living hope. And God, I pray that this morning as we sing a song of invitation, that you will challenge hearts. Maybe there's someone here this morning that's never accepted you. May this be the morning that they surrender their heart to you. What does that look like? It's simple. You don't ask us to get better. You don't ask us to change. You ask us to come just as we are and lay down our life and give it to you and accept you as our King and our Savior. Maybe there's someone here this morning that their priorities are all messed up and they're not living this hope the way they should be living. Challenge their hearts. Make them understand that this thing called life is serious. And that you've placed us here for a purpose. And that you want us to be your life. God, my prayer for us as a church is that we just won't live this, this living hope, but that we will live it the way you designed for us to live. And that we're sharing it every single moment. God, I pray that you'll guide and direct this invitation. Touch hearts, we pray in Christ's name. And amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand. We're going to stand in a couple verses just as I am. If there's any way we can be of any help, church membership, rededication, salvation, whatever it may be, please come. We'd love to pray with you. Amen.